Good morning, family. Hope everyone is doing well today. It's great to see everyone. So that new song that Brother Bill just said that was new to him and new to most of us here, if not all of us here, goes along with part of today's message. You see, when we sing to the Lord, when we sing songs like we just sang, it's important that we discern actual praise songs, actual worship songs, as opposed to songs that appeal to our feelings. Okay, what we just sang, most of the verses, most of the words came straight from Scripture. That is important that we make sure that what we are singing in praise to the Lord lines up with what is in the Bible. Today, worship is going to be part of what we will be looking at. If you will, please, all join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that you've given us that we're able to come together, Lord. We thank you for the blessings, even though we are not deserving, that you still give them freely. Lord, we just ask as we look into your word that you help us to discern what is important, that we may grow, become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So when I say the word worship, what is, what is it that you think of? A lot of times, worship is associated with song. Worship is not necessarily just song, though. And it's important that we understand this. If I were to go off and ask each individual person here what their interpretation of what it meant to worship was, eight out of ten would be completely different. You may have one or two people that believe the same exact thing when it comes to worship, but for the most part, there's always something different. If I were to tell you that I believe part of worship can be gauged off the idea of what do you spend time with most? Do you spend time with the Lord? Do you spend time with electronics? Whatever it is that you spend a majority of your time with could be an indication of what you worship. An overwhelming majority of American Christians, when asked how much time they spend reading the Bible as opposed to how much time they spend on their phone, 98% spend twice as much, if not more, time on their phone than they do reading the Bible. Now, the, the numbers can be skewed because there are those that said they don't read the Bible at all, and that's a whole other problem. I would say that it's safe to say that the people who spend more time on their phones than they do in Scripture would probably argue if I said that that's what they worship, is they worship their phones, if they, if they worship their computers. I talked to one young man and I said like this, I said, okay, you claim that you're a Christian. I said, where's your Bible? Well, I don't have one, but my parents have one on the shelf. Okay, so the Bible you have is on a shelf. Where's your phone? Pulls it right out of his pocket. I said, I noticed that you have a case on there. Well, yeah, I got to protect it. Okay, so you protect this phone. Right. All right. You plug the phone in. Do you make sure that it's charged? Make sure it's ready for you, available for you? Absolutely. What's the point of having it if you don't charge it and use it? Right. Okay. Now apply that to the Bible. What's the point of having something like the wisdom of God and not using it? That's foolish, isn't it? Now he puts a case on his phone to protect the phone. A lot of people, they put covers and cases on their Bibles to protect their Bibles. Again, he didn't think of it in those terms. And once I was done talking to him about it, he goes, okay, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe I do think more about my phone than I do about the Bible, but that doesn't make me a bad Christian. That just means that I like my phone. 
Okay? If that's the argument you want to make, the only thing I can do is caution you that you may want to rethink how much time you spend with your electronics versus how much time you spend with the Word of God. Today I want to speak to people, to you specifically, about worship. And as we consider what that means to us, I want to highlight the danger of worshiping the wrong things. Now, we've looked in the past about worshiping idols, right? We know that that is a sin. I also want to look at what Scripture says about a very touchy subject, which is false converts, false believers. Those who will actually go to church out of habit, they'll sit there, they'll, they might sing the songs that you sing, but that's it, and then they'll leave, and they'll live their worldly lives. Now, one wouldn't necessarily think to associate with another, right? You think they're two different subjects, but they're not. They're connected because of the fact that you can look at how one worships and gauge their relationship with the Lord. Our verses that we'll be starting with today, now I'm not going to have the verses on the board for a couple of different reasons. That's why I gave you the handouts today, so that you have the Word of God in your hands. And for those that are watching later on online, I am going to encourage you now to grab your Bibles. We are going to have, not a Bible drill, but we're going to have quite a few verses that we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 17, and we'll be reading verses 22 through 28. What we'll be reading is a part of the second of two sermons which Luke recorded from Paul. The first, the more typical sermon, was Paul explaining to synagogues, to the Jews, how Jesus is the Messiah. But this one that we're going to be reading is different. Paul is going to be speaking to a group of Athenian philosophers. Paul uses from their poets words a way to introduce God, the creator God, the true God, a God who cannot be represented by idols. So if you haven't already, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Acts 17, chapter 22 is where we'll be starting. It says, and Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made, of, made with hands. Neither is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far, from, not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have one being, as certain also, as your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. When we're reading this, and if we look in it, we could separate these verses in the three main sections, we have the introduction, which is where Paul points out the evidence of ignorance of pagan worship. He points out the folly of their ways when they worship any god and all gods. The second part 
is the object of true worship. It's the point that we should be worshiping the one true God, not any God that we make up. And the third is the proper relationship between us and God. If we look at verse 22, the Athenian philosophers, the people that Paul was speaking to, more than likely knew little about Jewish prophecy. Meaning that they didn't understand what he was talking about because they weren't Jewish, and they were removed from the entire situation. So they had no interest in this Messiah that Paul was talking about. So Paul uses what they did know. And we see this even now today in a way of witnessing to people. You find common ground. And then you work from that common ground to build the foundation of the true God. When he arrived, Paul said he noticed that the city was filled with idols. So many that they had an altar to an unknown God, just in case they missed anybody. They weren't worshiping out of love. They were worshiping out of fear. So much so that they built an idol just in case they forgot a God because they didn't want to upset any gods. So he began saying, you're too superstitious. Now that's the King James version. In other translations, other than the King James, it says, you're too religious. Now, very religious or too religious, the word is from the Greek root word, D is a diet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally butcher this, but I'm going to try my best. D is a diamond, which means pious or superstitious. So that word can be interpreted both ways. Either it can be pious or religious, or it could be superstitious. I think superstitious fits that a little bit better, knowing that they had multiple idols that they were worshiping. He's literally talking about how he witnessed multiple houses, houses that they built for their gods, many gods. In school, I used to be a smart aleck when it came to certain things, and in school we used to learn about Greek and Roman mythology. Now this Greek and Roman mythology was all about the Roman gods and the Greek gods, which were extremely similar. And I would sit there and I would listen to these things, and we have proof that these gods, little g, that these people believed in actually had shrines because we have archaeologists who've dug up these buildings that were dedicated to these gods, these entities like Zeus, Athena. We, we can look at these and touch them even. So we know, once again, history, archaeology, is proving the Bible correct. We know by what we've seen dug up in these foreign lands to us that the Bible is not off base. When Paul says you had many houses, he's talking about the fact that they had many gods that they served. In verse 23, he explains, for as I was passing through, considering all these objects of worship, he found one that was very, very troubling at first. The one with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one who you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. See, what Paul does there is pretty smart. He says to himself, they worship an unknown God. I'm going to take this knowledge and I'm going to apply my God to that unknown God. I'm going to tell them the one true living God is the God that they don't even know that they're worshiping. And that's where he builds the bridge between their thinking and truth. By connecting our God, the creator God, as the unknown God, he claims that he's not teaching a foreign de deity. He identifies our God as the God and the Lord of heavens and earth. 
In verse 24 and 25, Paul says to them, the God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands. As though God needed anything from us. Because we know that this isn't true. God does not need anything from us. Since he himself gives to all people life, breath, and all things. Paul is speaking to the fact that they have buildings for everything that they worship, yet none of them mattered, as if a building could contain a God, our God. A building cannot contain, one building cannot contain our God. He's greater than that. To create these things, to create these temples and these idols is one thing. But when they start to worship them, when they go there and worship these idols, especially an idol to an unknown God, it's not only futile because there's no life in those idols, there's no life in those temples, but it's also a sin. We know this because God has said it's a sin for idolatry. Throughout history, mankind has made false gods in his image. And every time that man has done this, they've created this false deity with one flaw. And that flaw is that somehow these deities need something from us or want something from us. One of them, just to, just to throw out a couple of ideas of what I'm talking about, of man-made deities. Anything that says, or anyone, there's been deities that have been made up. Here's one that says, there was a God, little g, that made the earth, and the reason for creating humans was so that the humans could work the earth for God. Okay? Or there's also gods of fertility that need reminding or they need sacrifices to remind them to help us be fertile. Or gods of weather that also need sacrifices to remind them to make it rain. As if we need to remind gods that they are gods that create and that control things. Now one of my personal pet peeves with gods, and this is one that is still around today, and unfortunately, people are ignorant enough to believe. And that is that there is a false god that exists solely for the purpose of having intercourse with his spirit wife. And what they do is they populate their own world. And these, these ignoramuses that actually believe this, these people that are fooled into believing this, they're fooled into believing that if they do everything the way that this God who calls his wife through the veil is pleased with what they do, then they themselves become gods. That they themselves get a world in which they get to procreate and populate. For the only reason to do this is just for the simple fact that they can. No other reason. I do not understand how they can believe that this God that I just described is in any way the one true living God. He is not. There is no way to draw a parallel line be between the God of the Bible and the God that these people worship. And it's disturbing that the people that believe this are willing to fight so hardenly for it. And they're willing to cut off all communication to make sure that their beliefs are upheld within their community. The God of the Bible, the one true living God, does not need anything from us. He's not pointless. Oh yeah, and by the way, the, the God that they worship, the God that I just described, that God was created by another God, which was created by another God. 
and so on. And it's an infinite number of gods. So what god are they truly worshiping? You cannot worship what you call your god that can then say, well, I worship that god. It makes no sense. Common sense would dictate that that's not right. The Bible says that's not right. If for no other reason, don't listen to me, read the Bible. The God of the Bible, the one true living God, our God, is mighty and worthy of being praised. But He's also gracious. He is our Father, and He provides for His children. We serve Him out of love and thankfulness, not out of fear. Now, verses 26 through 28, the Athenians, who believe that they were unique. They believed that among the peoples of the world, the other cultures were nothing but barbarians. Paul's argument was, you're not special. Instead, he explains that all human beings descended from one ancestor whom God created. Paul declared that God determined the lifespan of and the geographical boundaries. God decreed the times and the history of humanity to be what it is. God is sovereign, and he pre-appointed all this. When God said, I knew you before you were even formed, he wasn't lying. Paul is saying that God is in control of everything, even national entities. Now, there are some people that let their patriotism run away with them that seem to want to claim that the United States is ordained by God. It's one of the important nations. We've seen in the Bible nations rise and fall. We are no different. And to think so is not only naive, but it shows pride when we shouldn't have it. In the book of Daniel, it says, And he, being God, changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. That is the truth. There is no nation, not one, that can claim sovereignty and the ability to dictate their destiny. Right now, I can tell you though, Israel is under attack from all sides. They are one of the smallest, if not the smallest, I'm not a geography major, they are one of the smallest nations in the world, yet they still stand tall. We know from what I just read that God removes kings and raises up kings Replace kings with nations. God upholds nations when he sees fit. That is why I'm guaranteeing, I, I can't guarantee, I take that back. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm not going to make predictions. I can say without, certain, with, without being uncertain that I believe that Israel will still stand regardless of what's going on right now because God has ordained it to stand. What Paul does next is he brings our God closer to his creation, the creation being the Athenians, by explaining that God's plan is establish the nations to encourage people to seek him. If we look at what's going on with Israel right now, there have been a lot of people that have been asking questions because they associate Israel, the Jews, with God, with the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's in turn people to seek God. That's for God's glory. It's part of His plan. And even though it seems atrocious, the, the things that have happened to Israel, and I, for one, would love to see everybody just back off and have Israel do what they do, which is protect themselves, but they've never been unfair. 
They've always been fair in their dealings. They need to be left alone. I believe they are God's people. It is God's land. When we look at these verses, we know that God is not far from any of us. And even the Greek poets said that God gives people life. And further, they said that we are his offspring. Those are things that were common beliefs within the Athenian people. And so Paul was able to use that to build upon more common ground. Now, when we look at these verses and we look at what Paul did, like I said, that's a recipe for witnessing to people. Because you're going to run into people that don't believe in God at all. Or you're going to run into people, like I said, who believe in some God that's there just to procreate. But what we want to do is we want to find common ground when we witness to someone. We want to find something and say, okay, you believe in God. Well, my God says this. The Bible says this. What does your God say? And build upon that. Because the more that we talk about our God, the more that we witness to people about our God, the more they're going to want to seek him. They're going to want to find for themselves the greatness that is our God. These verses cause me to have a question. I love asking questions. So I'm going to ask you a question that I want you to think about. Can you really worship what you don't know? Are you capable as a human of worshiping the unknown. If you go off of what Paul said, the Athenians were doing just that. They worshipped the unknown God. They didn't understand who this unknown God was. They had no idea of the unknown God. But they worshipped him nonetheless. In Isaiah, we hear about this happening before. In Isaiah 13, it says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. That sounds like what we're living in today. There are churches filled with people who come and worship but their hearts are so far removed from the Lord that they wouldn't know him if, they, if he stood right in front of them. I want to take it a step further, though, because I want to say that not only are they capable of worshiping without understanding, but I believe that there are those that call themselves Christians through ignorance. They claim to be something they don't know anything about. There's an account of the Samaritan woman at the well. And I don't know how many of you know this account of the Samaritan woman at the well, but I'm just going to go ahead and give you a brief overview. The Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus asked for a drink of water, and her response was, imagine this, a Jew asking a Samaritan, somebody who you don't have anything to do with, for a drink of water. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who I am, you would ask and I would give you the living water. Now he explains that everyone who drinks of her water that she had would be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that Jesus would give shall never be thirsty. But the water that I will give, he says, will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Now with this interaction, I'm going to read a little bit further. Because the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, 
for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in the spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. After their interaction, this woman left the well. She left the bucket she was filling. She went into the city and she said to the men that she found, come and see the man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Even though Jesus told her, I am the Messiah you speak of, and even though he told her all the things she did, she still said, could this be the Christ? That is what we're dealing with with Christians, not all, but some Christians today. They don't, they have an idea of who Christ is. They know who Christ is, but they don't know Christ. They know of God, but they don't know God. I have to be honest. I said that once before to someone when I said that they knew of God, but didn't know God. And this one person looks at me and goes, you don't know God. You can't know God. You don't know Jesus either. You just know of him. I said, wrong. I know God, and anyone who reads the Bible knows God. And he says, no, you don't. I said, let me ask you a question. You're married, right? And he says, absolutely. I said, do you know what your wife likes? Yes. Do you know what your wife wants for you? Yes. Do you love your wife? Yes. If I were to ask you, what's your wife's favorite movie, would you be able to tell me? Yes. If I were to ask you what your wife's biggest pet peeve is, would you be able to tell me? Yes. I said, this book right here, the Bible, tells me what God likes, what he doesn't like. This book tells me what God has planned. It tells me what he wants for me. And it tells me how he loves me. So I do know God. Anyone who reads the Bible knows God. That is what the relationship that we have is. And there are some who call themselves Christians that do not understand this relationship. They just think that because they said some words, that they came down the aisle one time, whether it was when they were a child or an adult, and they said the sinner's prayer that all of a sudden, that's all they needed. Some pastors call that fire insurance. The sad thing is, is that that's a false sense of security. Because that's not what it takes to be saved. That's not what makes you a Christian. Saying words does not make you a Christian. If you truly believe, if you truly repent of the sins that you've committed, and if you truly give your life to the Lord, it will change who you are. It will change your life. That tells you that you have truly repented of everything that you've done and that you are saved. Because we know that when we are saved, we are a new creation. The old has passed away. You cannot be a slave to sin and act worldly and want worldly and say that you're a servant of the Lord. Because we know God says you cannot serve two masters, for you'll hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve money, the world, and the Lord. We know this. I've given you two more texts that I want to look at. They illustrate the fact that it's possible to know the Lord, but not truly know Him, to know of Him. Turn with me to the next text, which is going to be in Matthew 25. We're going to be reading 1 through 13. 
25.1 says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And they went to buy. And the bridegroom came, and they that, went, they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, this is a parable that Jesus told that illustrates a lot of people say the saved from the unsaved. Those who are foolish are the unsaved. They're not going to be prepared. And those who are saved are the ones that are going to have the oil. But I look at it a little bit differently. You see, I look at it as the Bible says the ten all did what? They prepared for the bridegroom to come. They went forth to meet the bridegroom, which means they knew of Jesus. At least the, the five foolish ones knew of Jesus, so much so that they took their lamps and went out to meet him. But they were foolish because they weren't prepared. Because even though they knew of him, they didn't know what they needed to do to go and meet him. Now the five wise... Obviously, they were prepared. They knew what it would take to go out and meet the bridegroom. And when he came, the unwise, the foolish, said, give us yours. Give us some of yours. What I like to equate that to is if somebody came up to you and said, give me some of your faith so that I may be saved. Is that possible? Can your faith save someone else? Absolutely not. So the wise, of course, said, no, you have to go and get your own. Because my faith, my oil, is sufficient for my salvation. It's going to bring me to the bridegroom. My faith will lead me to Jesus. That is where we have to look around even look at ourselves, do that spiritual inventory, and make sure we're not one of the five foolish. Make sure that we're not caught, as, a, as an old boxing term, caught flat-footed. We do not know the time or the date that he will return. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be prepared. Whenever I read that parable, I immediately go to the other verses that I've given you in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, because they complement each other perfectly. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are going to be people who think that they are saved. They will do things in the name of the Lord but they're not truly saved. Jesus will look at them and go, I never knew you. 
That is a concern that each one of us should have is to make sure that we are not one of the, one of the ones who are going to be looked at and said, depart from me. I never knew you. We need to ensure that when that day comes, we are right with God. There's a real danger of being one of the foolish. And it's important that we take inventory of our lives. We make sure that when we look at our lives, our exterior is reflecting what we hold inside. That our actions reflect our love for the Lord. In both worship and in conversion, it's possible that we can do these things without understanding. I had an argument recently with somebody who said, well, it's just important that we go out there and we get people saved by just telling them Jesus. Tell them how great it is to be a Christian. I said, that's wonderful, but true conversion, true salvation doesn't come from just knowing a little teeny bit. It's from reading the Bible. It's from being informed. So whereas it's great to share the gospel, it's also equally important that you make sure that the person you're sharing the gospel with is being followed up on. They're being discipled. They're being shown what it truly means to be a Christian. If not, they might as well be listening to one of those prosperity preachers being led astray. They will forever be a goat and possibly not even know it. When Jesus said, God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, I want to talk about that for just a minute. Worship is not a song or hymns that we sing on Sunday. A lot of people think that that's what it is, but worship's not just the songs, and it's not the amount of money you give and the offering. These are all expressions of worship. Just like the pastor who said that when you're baptized, it's an outward expression of an inward possession. When we do things that express our worship to the Lord, that's exactly what it is. When we sing, we should be singing to express our worship. Worship be something that's held inside. So when we look at it and it says worship God in the spirit, it means, among other things, that it has to come within you. It must be sincere. And it must be motivated by our love for God, not out of fear or out of obligation. It can't be something that you do just because you've always done it since you were a little kid. It has to be done out of gratitude for all that God has done for us. To worship in truth, it means that our worship must follow Scripture. It must be informed by what God says we should be doing. Worship's not meant to be formed out of how we feel. If you notice, we don't sing a lot of contemporary, brand new Christian songs because those songs aren't meant to actually bring glory to God. They're more of, this is how I feel. This is how God makes me feel. Ultimately, those are worthless. What should happen is when we sing the songs, it's okay that those songs make us feel a certain way, but those songs have to be from within. The worship comes from within. That's why we should never sing songs that contain heresy, things that are not in the Bible. Because when we do, what are we saying? That it's okay to not follow what God says? True worship can shine a light on the priority we place on where God is in our lives. Worship can include praying, reading the Bible, singing, and participating in communion. That is a form of worship, the Lord's Supper, as well as serving others. Now that one, some people go, I don't know. Serving others is a form of worship. What Tino and I do when we collect, as a group, when we collect for the homeless, and when Tino and I go out, 
We're not doing that to glorify us. We're doing that to glorify God. We are doing that as a worship to God. So serving others is an act of worship. It's not limited to one thing. And when it comes to being made new, Matthew 17, or 7, 13 and 14, Jesus tells that the road leads to eternal life is narrow and that only a few find it. And broad is a road with a wide gate that leads to destruction. There are some that are sitting in churches that are on that broad road. They don't want to give up worldly things. They call themselves Christians, but they hold on dearly to those pet sins of theirs. Their desire to live an easy Christian life produces little fruit, if any at all. And that's important that we look at the fruit that's produced. Matthew 7, 16 through 18 says, You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorn from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. We are to be fruit inspectors. We are to look at the fruits that people bear. False converts are selfish. They're devoted to themselves and the world, whereas true converts live lives obedient to God, following His commandments. Now, that's not saying that we don't break commandments. That's not saying that we don't sin. It's saying that we try to avoid sin. We don't want to be habitual sinners. We do fall into sin from time to time, but there's a difference between falling into sin and jumping into sin. I want to leave you with words from 2 Timothy 2.19. And it says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone whose names, the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. If you are a Christian and you claim the name of Christ... May your lives reflect that choice.